model of church is correct. Hello, I'm Malcolm Cox and welcome to What We're Reading. And this is episode, what number? 57. And today we're taking a look at a book I've been reading recently called Character and Virtue in Theological Education. If you're watching the video, there's a shot of it. That's the book. Character and Virtue in Theological Education by Marvin Oxenham. I've been reading this book for a little while. Normally, I would bring you a review of the whole book in these uh, recordings, and I will do at some point. But this book is taking a while to read. It's quite uh, dense in a good way, and one of those books you have to read slowly to absorb it. I'm reading a chapter a day in the mornings. I'm up to chapter 19 now, uh, while sitting on my exercise bike pedaling not particularly fast uh, but nonetheless pedaling and i'm enjoying the book it's making me think a lot and right before i bring you a review of the whole book i thought i must i must share with you something from one of the chapters that i've really has really made me think which is how we decide what the best model is for for church so let's have a look at this today and as i share with you the thoughts of Marvin on these different models of church. I'd like to ask you to bear in mind perhaps three questions as we go through this. Firstly, of the models I'm going to share now, which one best fits your current congregation? So if you're going to say this model is what we have locally here, what would that be? Secondly, if the model that I describe strikes you in some ways being attractive and appealing. Which one would that be? Which one fits your preferences about church, if you like? I'd like to know what you think about that. And thirdly, which one fits best with what you see as the biblical mandate for what church is meant to be like? Which one fits best? You'll find that all of them fit in one way or another, but in your, at least in your opinion, your understanding, which one fits best? So which one best describes your current circumstances, your current church? Which one fits your preferences for church? And which one do you think fits what the Bible actually, actually describes? Now let's have a brief look at a description of each model in turn. So the mo model number one, described in the book, model number one, love God and neighbor. Love God and neighbor neighbor. To quote from the book, page 87, in this kind of church, leaders express love in all its dimensions, ranging from pastoral care to the transformation of culture. Love in all its dimensions. A primary scripture, perhaps, for this model could come from John 13, 34, 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Uh, if love is, as uh, Marvin uh, refers to it in the book, if love is the queen of the theological virtues, it's hard to argue with the primary nature of this model. And if this is how the world will know that we are truly followers of Jesus, then why would we want to prioritize anything above love? So what do you think about that model? That model focuses on love, loving God and neighbor. Model number one. Right. Model number two. Model number two is this. Lead, liberating persons and societies from oppression. Liberating persons persons and societies from oppression. Again, to quote from the book, page 87, this vision embraces moral and social reform and those in leadership serve as agents of change, freeing both individuals and collectives from bondage. There's a great deal of bondage in our world today, isn't there? A great deal of oppression. And as I was thinking about this model, the Scripture that came to mind was the one that Jesus himself quoted at the beginning of his mission in Luke 4, verses 17 to 21. He brings out the scroll of Isaiah, he opens it, and he reads the passage that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel to the 
poor, and not just the material poor, right? The poor. He sent me to proclaim release for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favourable year of the Lord. Closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. Everybody's eyes in the synagogue are fixed on him, understandably. And then he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's clearly stating this, what I've just talked about, is what I have been sent to do. And it's about liberating the oppressed. So the question is, if this was the vision of Jesus for his ministry, should it not also be the vision for the contemporary church, yours and mine? It certainly sounds like good news. And it was viewed that way in, on that day that Jesus visited the synagogue and in, by a lot of people around him as he went on with his ministry. So that's our second model for church today. Liberating persons and societies from oppression. Is that your church? Would you like it to be? That's number two. Third model. The third model is the model that focuses on creating and sustaining Christian identity. Creating and sustaining Christian identity. To quote from the book, this time page 88. For this tradition, maintaining identity is considered an urgent and important task in the midst of a quickly changing pluralistic and syncretistic world the role of the minister is to revive and redefine the distinctive identity of the church. To revive and redefine the distinctive identity of the church. Because our con cultural context changes, we have to keep thinking about what it means to revive and redefine the distinctive identity of the church. That's different from for me here in the UK, from perhaps yourself in Vietnam or in Australia or in Russia or in the United States, wherever you are. It'll be a little bit different for you to revive and redefine the distinctive identity of the church. A scripture that might apply to this would, could be what Peter had in mind when he wrote 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. Well, who are you? Who are you Christians in, in your church? Who are you? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellence of says of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light for you once were not a people but now you are the people of God you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy so thinking about this model it's emphasizing our identity because if we don't know who we are we cannot know our mission if we don't if we don't protect and purify our identity when it gets compromised we cannot be distinctive in this world and therefore useful to God. So that's our third model, the model that's about creating and sustaining Christian identity. What do you think so far? Which, which one of these models does your church fit in? Fourth model. The fourth model is this. The, the, uh, the model for church is essentially the pursuit of an evangelical mission. The pursuit of of an evangelical mission. To quote again from the book, here, the church is mostly seen as an agent of salvation that rescues the world from sin through the gospel and builds the personal lives of believers according to biblical discipleship patterns. Agent of salvation, rescuing the world from sin through the gospel, building the lives of believers according to biblical discipleship patterns. Now, when Jesus was about to uh, depart this world, he left his followers with a command that's, that would become, becomes the motto for this model of church. It's Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all, that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So disciple making is the activity towards which all other functions in this church model are subservient. Everything has to serve making disciples. And you could argue, what is the point of all the other things a church can do 
if people are not becoming Christians and growing to reproduce as Christians, helping other people become Christians. Makes sense, doesn't it? Seemed important to Jesus. Surely it must be primary to the church model that we adopt. So that's number four, the pursuit of an evangelical mission. How are we doing? Is your, does your church fit one of these? Does your preferences fit one of these more than the others? What about your view of the biblical perspective? Fifthly and finally, the fifth model is the, is the model of pastoral care. Pastoral care. Again, to quote from the book in page 88, in this model, the purpose of the church is to help people find their spiritual and mental health. It is, in a way, a vocation to human fullness. Human fullness is the goal here. The purpose of the church, help people find their spiritual health and their mental health, to grow into all of what they can be healthily. A strap line for this church model could well be John 10.10. 10. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly in all of its fullness, filling it up to all we can be spiritually, emotionally, mentally, I guess, in all of those spheres. So the purpose of the church is to help people grow into all they can be, because surely that would be attractive to the world. That would bring glory to God. People would say, my word, this Christianity thing, it works. So the focus of church leadership and of the church is to is to build up and nurture one's personal growth spiritually and mentally in every sense so that God will get glory. That's another model. I mean, the argument is, is legitimate that surely Jesus does not want us simply to be saved, but to grow into all that we can be as a child of his. So our connection with God needs healing. That's the salvation part. But so does much more than that. As my friend John often says, everybody gets saved. Not everybody gets healed. Maybe that should be the primary per, uh, focus of the church. If we are to be the Christ of the church of Christ on this earth, we must become a model of what is possible with the spirit of Christ healing us from within. Well, that's our fifth and final model. I mean, maybe you could think of other models, but these are the five that uh, I talked about in the book. I rather like the way that uh, they were put. It was put, there was more in there than I've given you today, but I wanted to keep this <laughs> a reasonable length. Five models. And of course, many other scriptures could be cited to support each of these models. I've given you one for each, because, but there are plenty of others. What's the purpose in doing this today? Well, this brief overview of these five church models, I think it's, uh, I, I offer them because I think it's helpful for us to consider which model our church has as its primary model and why. I wonder what struck you about all of these. I mean, my childhood was spent primarily in churches broadly inhabiting the third model we talked about today, that of creating and sustaining Christian identity. Uh, those of us in the church building on a Sunday when I was a, a youngster, we knew who we were. We knew why we were there. Uh, the hymns, the scripture readings, the rituals, even the buildings, even the building itself set us apart from the world. And in some ways, I benefited from that. I knew why I was there. I knew what was distinctive about me compared to people who did not sing those hymns or read those scriptures or perform those rituals or enter those buildings. They, there was clarity in that sense. In other, way, in other ways, of course, <clears throat> the model was, was problematic because to those not of the Christian faith, although they could see we were distinctive, the church looked and felt um, exclusivist, irrelevant and unsympathetic. Some strengths to that, some weaknesses. And my uh, adult life, the majority of my adult Christian life has been spent in the fourth model we talked about, the one about pursuing an evangelical mission. And there have been many benefits from that model. Uh, again, to quote from the book, the strong emphasis on practical theology and on field experiences that relate to evangelism, church planting, communication, pastoral care, and discipleship. All right, those are all good things. They've given me many wonderful experiences of helping people to be united with God through Christ. That's been a wonderful experience. But it has to be said, sadly, as with every model, any overemphasis on one aspect of church life has diminished the significance of other 
edifying and nurturing emphases. So, for example, those gifted at evangelism in this model, the gifted at evangelism were too often promoted to positions of significant influence on the basis of their gifts and skills in that area rather than their fundamental spirituality. Indeed, for myself, my spiritual life, my connection with God and the deepening of it, suffered from a lack of attention being paid to the depth of my connection with God. For as long as I was evangelizing and being effective, then, well, that doesn't matter so much, does it? I'm not saying that was taught like that, but that was the practical outworking of one side of the weakness of such a model. Now, <clears throat> my point in producing this summary article and recording is is not to point fingers and say, well, that's bad and that's bad and, and so on. That's, that's really not the point at all. I myself have led have led people over the years with an imbalanced understanding of these models, and I uh, I apologise to any of you that I've uh, damaged spiritually in some way or hurt in some way by my not understanding and considering the balance and the blend of the strengths and the weaknesses of these different models as I was at that point in time in one of those models. So the issue, the issue at hand, and what I'm hoping that this recording would prompt us to think about and debate and discuss in our local congregational setting. The issue is not to denigrate one model and say that's a bad model or that's useless, but to discover what is valuable in each one of them. And maybe to find a way, by, by God's grace, to blend them into something which, varied as it will be according to cultural and temporal context, will best reveal our Heavenly Father to this world that needs to know him so desperately. Can we? Can we find what is valuable in each of these models and blend them in such a way to meet the needs of our current cultural, social, situational context? How can we blend these? Wouldn't it be wonderful if instead of fighting battles about which model is best, instead we could take the best, blend them together, by God's grace, and live out something that's a bit different, that uses all of what God has intended for the church so that we can be all we can be for the world around us. Well, your thoughts, please. I'd really like to know what you think about these models and how we might draw the best out of them for God's glory. Have you read the book by any chance? If you have, I'd like to know what you think about it. Uh, or have you read other books about church models and if so do let me know and, and uh, if I have time I will read them myself as well or you can just tell me what you think about those those books and those church models so please drop me a line let me know what you think you can leave a comment anywhere you hear or see this recording uh, or you can email me malcolm at malcolmcox.org if you know anybody that might benefit from this recording do please pass the link on and leave a review wherever you possibly could if you have other suggestions for other books, then please do let me know. If you like the ebook, my free ebook on spiritual disciplines, I'll be glad to send that to you if you sign up for my newsletter on my website, malcolmcox.org. Until the next time, then, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. We're learning as we read. God, God is uh, enabled to speak to us and speak to our community through what we read. Let's read. Let's internally uh, uh, um, develop our thinking. And I, as I think this is for me, and I hope it is for you, keep reading, keep learning, keep sharing what we're learning, and to God be the glory. Until the next time, take care, and God bless.